Good evening and welcome to the Carter Centre. A special word of welcome to the students who are with us from various institutions in the Atlanta area, to our donors and friends and neighbours, and of course our virtual world, the online audience. The conversations at the Carter Centre series gives us an opportunity to discuss ongoing Carter Centre initiatives and current world issues with our neighbours in the Atlanta area and around the world. We would encourage you to learn more about the work of the Carter Centre by visiting cartercenter.org slash conversations. Tonight's event is being webcast live via the same address, cartercenter.org. After our opening discussion, we will take audience questions via the microphones in the side aisles here. It gives me great honor to receive our guests this evening. And before I say a word of introduction about who they are, <laughs> it was a test to see if we're all present here. <laughs> and awake. And awake, yes, exactly. <laughs> Before I say a word of introduction about who they are, uh, simply a brief word about the longevity of relationship that the Carter Center has enjoyed and benefited from by working over the course of more than three decades uh, in Sudan as a whole. Um, we're privileged this evening also to have present with us uh, Dr. John Hardman, who is our president and CEO, um, also very privileged to have partnered with Dr. Sita Ranchad Nielsen at the Institute for Developing Nations at Emory University in bringing about a series of related conversations on the prospects for peace in the two Sudans. And we've been very much, uh, have benefited from that partnership with the Institute for Developing Nations, so thank you. The Carter Center's motto, as, as you may well know, um, waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope, uh, those three uh, ambitious aims uh, have somehow been brought to life around the work that has been done in partnership with the people of Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, for, as mentioned, more than three decades, the Carter Center has been engaged in both health and peace. Um, we were uh, privileged to help with the cessation of hostilities that allowed for uh, the beginning of humanitarian access to occur, specifically in the initial surveys around what the presence of guinea worm was in, in southern Sudan at the time. Uh, we continue that partnership by assisting in the brokering of the Nairobi Peace Agreement, which reestablished diplomatic relations between Sudan and Uganda. We've continued a presence there in peace uh, by observing the national elections, the referendum on the right to self-determination, ultimately leading to the independence of the Republic of South Sudan, and continue to have a presence there through uh, a political observation uh, office in Khartoum. In addition to that work, our health programs remain active. The South, South Sudan, remains the focal point for the global campaign for Guinea worm eradication. In peace, I'm privileged to manage from here the Carter Center's uh, partnership with the Ebony Center for Future Studies, excuse me, the Ebony Center for Strategic Studies in Juba and the Future Studies Center in Khartoum, where we have been thinking together by way of a dialogue initiative, the Sudan-South Sudan Dialogue Group Initiative. Ambassador Nuraldine Sati and Professor Jock Madut Jock are both members of that dialogue group initiative. And we'll say a bit about that. But independent of that, they are contributing in their own way to the building of both of their nations. Professor Jock Madut Jock most recently served as the Undersecretary at the Ministry of Culture 
the first undersecretary at the Ministry of Culture. He also was the founder and visionary for one of South Sudan's first think tanks, the Sud Institute, and I would encourage you to look at their website because they do exceptional policy briefings that inform decision makers about some of the critical issues facing South Sudan as a whole and bilaterally with Sudan, its, its neighbor. Ambassador Nuruldin Sati, who currently serves as the Director General of Sudan's National Library, previously within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as an ambassador to numerous countries, including France, where he is also representative at the Vatican, but also as an advisor to UNESCO's global campaign around a culture for peace, leading a number of peace initiatives within the Great Lakes and the Horn of Africa in that capacity, including serving as the Deputy Secretary General's representative, special representative in Burundi. We're honored by your presence, Professor Jock, Ambassador Sati, and look forward to hearing your reflections around the prospects for peace between the two Sudans and the challenges that you face therein. So, Professor Jock, two years and some months, the Republic of South Sudan, arguably the world's newest nation, what would you say were the factors that led to the independence, the very independence of South Sudan? Thank you, Itonde, and good evening to all of you. Um, it's a privilege to be with you tonight. Uh, thanks uh, to the Carter Center and to Itonde for facilitating our coming here. It's a, it's a great um, opportunity uh, to see uh, uh, firsthand some of the work that the Carter Center has been doing in, in my country and a work that we truly, truly appreciate. And uh, we pray in South Sudan that President Carter uh, will have health to continue the work that he has been doing politically and also in the, in the area of health. Um, <clears throat> I think it will be an achievement that he will be very, very uh, proud to have done uh, to, to, to make life easier for the people of Sudan and people of South Sudan. Um, two years ago, uh, what used to be Africa's largest country uh, split into two. And uh, what led to that, that split is uh, the subject of, of books and books <laughs> to be written. Uh, but suffice to say that that split was a result of a realization uh, among the leaders of the both parts that 50 years of conflict had torn apart what was one country. So perhaps trying another approach uh, is, is, uh, should, be, uh, should be searched for. And so the split was seen as a, a way to end the conflict because that violent history uh, was not possible to, to sustain in a unified country. And so it is better to have two countries living in peace, side by side, in harmony with each other and within themselves. So that is really the, 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 issue, the, the gist of the agreement that was signed in 2005 uh, to end the conflict as a way to say, We've tried unity and it has not worked. So let's try uh, a split. And, and uh, I should proceed to say that this should be a cautionary note to the Ram state, the leaders of the remaining uh, country of Sudan, that um, if they are not careful, uh, Sudan could further split into other Sudans uh, because uh, the very politics that led to frustration of the people of South Sudan, a frustration that led them to opt out of the Union, is still being experienced now in Blue Nile, in Kordofan, in Darfur. And if uh, leadership 
and courage are not exercised by the leaders of the current state of Sudan, you may well uh, expect that the people of Darfur and Blue Nile and Cote d'Ivoire will be frustrated the same way that the South was, so much that they might also seek a uh, breakaway. And that should be something that we, nobody would, would wish for such, for such an eventuality to happen. And so it, it needs uh, exercise of responsibility and leadership and foresight among the leaders of the current Sudan. Let me also just say that, um, um, that the lines, despite the independence of South Sudan, the lines that separate the two countries beyond the political uh, uh, settlements that were rich, the lines are not so clear that separate the two countries. And perhaps it is the, the, the less visible lines that we should really magnify to bring to the surface to give meaning to that very idea that creating two viable nations living in peace and harmony with each other is a better option than having one country torn apart by war. To give meaning to that, I think it is important for, country, for the country, for leadership and the citizens of both countries to look for the, the less visible lines that connect them, that have been forged throughout many centuries of coexistence and try to work on that and build on those to give meaning to that idea of two viable states living in peace and harmony with each other. Uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say one last thing and then I'll, I'll give a chance to, to, to my colleague to, to make uh, remarks. But I want to say, <laughs> uh, perhaps this will sound like a joke, but there are a couple of anecdotes. Uh, on January, 1st, January 9th, 2005, in the ceremony of the signing of the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Nairobi, uh, the late John Garan stood next to, John Garan was the, was, the, was the leader of South Sudan. Uh, next to him was Ali Osman Taha, the then Vice President of Sudan, who was the signatory of the CPA. And next to them was the former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, and uh, Museveni and, and other uh, heads of state. And one person asked, you know they keep t t telling us about the Arabs on this side and the Africans on that side, but when I look at these guys, I can't tell who is who. Can somebody help me? Who is the Arab among these guys and who is not? And somebody pointed at Colin Powell. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other anecdote is that in the 1990s, some of you may be aware that um, there were some peace talks in Abuja, Nigeria, several rounds of peace talks. And one of these uh, uh, negotiations, the delegation from the South, from the SPLA, SPLM, was led by a Northern Sudanese prominent academic and politician called Mansour Khalid. He led the delegation from the South. The Northern delegation coming from the government of NCP, the National Congress Party, the ruling party of Sudan, was led by a, a South Sudanese bishop called Bishop Rorij. So here you, ha you have people who have been at each other's throat and been fighting and so many people have died and yet their delegation are being led by people from the other side. So the mediators were looking at them and said, so what is the problem really? Uh, you <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any problem if you are leading each other's delegations. The idea behind, I'm saying this because to emphasize this idea that the lines separating the two countries are not so obvious. They are, not, they are completely blurry. So it is important that we focus on these lines that connect them. Uh, an example of these lines that connect them is, since independence, a lot of South Sudanese went to South Sudan from the north. But since then, so many of them have continued to return to the North. And the North Sudanese who had been traders in the South and lived in the South and only knew the South all their lives, who had to run away because they, they feared that perhaps their lives might be in jeopardy should the independence happen, but they have now all come back to South Sudan. Why do they do that? It is because there have been historical 
relationships, social and cultural relations that have been, been forged over these many decades that are now, that should be used as the foundation to build that idea of coexistence between two states. Uh, an example of these uh, South Sudanese who return or who still remain in Sudan uh, is that many of, many of them had homes. They had built their houses, they had businesses, and now they were being uh, forced to vacate their homes. And so they had a choice either to sell their homes, which they would have to sell under duress and they would not be able to get the value for it. And, and in fact, people will take advantage of that to try to agree among themselves not to offer uh, high prices. So instead of selling them under that circumstance, they would all give them to their friends, their northern Sudanese neighbors, telling them, you tell the rest of the, the, the country that you bought it from me, but you keep it for me until the situation changes, and when I come back, I'll come and get it from you. And they did. In fact, instead of staying in their homes, they move into the displaced persons camp. They go and live in, on a public square, awaiting uh, repatriation to this house, because if they stayed in it, the state cronies will take it. So they move into a, an open, uh, into a shack or into an open square in order to give that uh, idea that they have sold it to a northern Sudanese. Um, the same thing was done with the shops that were owned by northern Sudanese in the south, in Malakal, in Wao, in Juba. And now when these northern traders came back, they, had, they took their, their properties back easily. I mean, these kinds of things, I'm not saying them in order to, to downplay the the, the, the pain and the horrors of the war. So many horrible things have been done. But which way do we go? Do we focus on the horrible things that we have done to one another and emphasize them continuously at the risk of never having two viable states? Mm. Or do we look for avenues that could lead us to coexistence and peaceful um, uh, countries living in harmony? I think the choice is obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Job. Ambassador Sati, on July 9, 2011, the world recognizes that the Republic of South Sudan was born, but also a new Republic of Sudan was, in a sense, born. What has been the experience of Sudan since the independence of South Sudan? Uh, thank you, Itonde. Uh, let me, at the outset, express my uh, pleasure to be here at the Carta Center uh, and uh, uh, that express how privileged and honored I am to be here uh, and salute the uh, President and uh, uh, Madame uh, and, uh, and the public uh, who is here. Uh, actually, uh, for me, it is, uh, have been waiting for this moment for many years. Um, I accompanied President Numeri in his private jet when he came the day that Anwar Sadat jetted out of St. Andrews after signing uh, the Camp David Agreement. And uh, that would have been an opportunity for me to shake hands with President Carter. I have not done it because I, will not, I did not accompany uh, President Nimeri to the White House, and I stayed waiting for the delegation at Blair House. That's why I'm very happy to be able to have the opportunity of shaking hands with President Kalsa when I see him tomorrow. It's a dream that is coming true after more than 30 years. Um, to answer your question, I, have, I am one of those who have been writing on the question of identity in Africa and Sudan since the 70s. And one of the things that I have been writing and have been even known for in Sudan is what we call Sudanawiya in Sudan, which is Sudanism, that we are all Sudanese. We can come from north, from south, from east, from west. We can have our origins from the Middle East or from East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, but at the end of the day, we are Sudanese. I continue to believe that what is called now the Rainbow Nation is Sudan. And Sudan has always been 
considered as a microcosm of Africa. And the failure to keep that microcosm, to feel that, to keep that rainbow nation, is not only a failure for Sudan. It's a failure for Africa. It's a failure for the world at large. This continues to be my conviction. Why is it a failure? Because while we are talking in Africa about integration of the African countries, which is the motto of the African Union now, we are looking at the disintegration of certain African countries. We have a paradox in which the phenomena of integration and disintegration are fighting with each other on African soil. The problem of Sudan has been for too long conveyed as a struggle and a fight between Africans and non-Africans, Africans and Arabs, Christians and Muslims, North and South. What we see in the world today, what we see in Africa and in the Middle East, that the theory of conflict and violent conflict is no longer viable. What we see in Somalia, where my own dear wife comes from, they speak one language, they have one culture, they have one religion, and yet they are, have been a failed state for the last 20 years. We look at Egypt today, a country which was a haven of peace and tranquility for so long. Egyptians are fighting among themselves. We look at Syria, the Syrians are fighting among themselves, the majority of Muslims. I think we need to have a real look at the theories that we have been building for so long, which have been dividing this world and have brought us where we are now this pitiful situation that nobody wants to see, where we are no longer safe wherever we are. We are not safe in our homes, we are not safe in our embassies, we are not safe in our houses, we are not safe in, 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 in our offices, we are not safe in our airports, we are not safe wherever we go. And it's high time that we look at this situation and see why we have come to this conclusion. The tragedy of Sudan, I think, is part of this tragedy also. Because the ideology that we have built for so long has been so discriminatory uh, and, and building walls between races and cultures and colors. And this has been reflected on Sudan. And this is what has torn Sudan apart. I continue to believe that the Sudanese are one people. They are one people in two countries. And what my dear friend and, and brother here has just said proves that. There are these invisible lines which divide us, which was constructed on, on our minds, and which have no real reality uh, on the ground when we, we live with each other, and when we talk with each other, when we love each other, when we interact with each other. But of course we are faced with the reality also that injustice does exist, and that exclusion does exist, and that there are the rich and there are the poor. There are those who have the power and those who do not have that power. And often those who have the power, they misuse that power they have. They have the wealth, but they want to get even richer. And they use both power and wealth against those who are powerless. I, I continue to believe that there is a chance still to save Sudan, South Sudan, and the relation between them if there would be more common sense in what we are doing in both countries. For me, I continue to believe that both countries are my country. Whether I come from Sudan or I come from South Sudan, when I'm with my brother here, when I'm with my brother from, and sister from South Sudan, I have the same feeling that I had towards them when we were one country, that we belong to each other. There is something that links us together. And that explains what uh, Professor Jok uh, was saying. Now, how do we sustain peace between the two countries? It is important to, to have a look at the foundations of peace, how peace, peace can be built. 
peace can be built on equity, it can be built on justice, it can be built on equality, it can be built of a common vision of, of, of a sense of interest. Finally, the two countries have come to their senses, or the leaders have come to their country senses, and realize that it is important to look at their own interests and the interests of their people. God has given us a lot of things. He has given us land, has given us water, has given us oil, has given us gold. There are many other things that we do not know. These are two very rich countries. They have a unique position in the African country, continent. They have the River Nile, the Great River Nile, blue, white, and the Nile that goes to Egypt. What have we done with these riches? Have been fighting. At long last, I think now we realize the importance of taking into consideration our vested interests in living together. The, that oil that has been discovered is a lifeline between us. A lifeline for the economies, but is there another lifeline which is even more important, the water that comes from the Great Lakes and flows into Egypt. This lifeline also we should take into consideration. We should take into consideration the natural unity that exists between Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, and all those countries. This is a unity, a regional unity, and we should develop around that. I would really uh, hope that Sudan and South Sudan together will recognize the important role that they have in playing their regional roles playing it in an intelligent way that will preserve their interests in living together and living in harmony within the region and work for the integration of that region. Agreements have been signed between the two countries in September last year. These agreements should be respected, should be implemented. We have a beginning of implementation of the agreements and we should continue uh, to do that. We have the rich border areas between the two countries where we have one third of the population and two thirds of the natural resources of Sudan in the border areas. So it makes sense that we, we adopt this theory of soft borders because borders are anyway are fictitious borders. And we have every interest to see to it that there is a free flow of people and goods between the two countries. South Sudan needs commodities that are, that are made in, in Sudan. And Sudan needs the, all the talent and the commodities also which are produced in South Sudan. So an exchange of goods and interests is very important. An agreement has been signed also for the four freedoms. This agreement, I think, can cement the relations between the two countries. Something very ridiculous happened. People who lived in, in, in Sudan and South Sudan and were born there and lived for 50 years had to abandon, as Jok was saying, their homes and houses and go to the other country for no good reason. In the United States, you can live in this country for 10 years and then become a citizen or have a green card or a passport. In Africa, if you live for 500 years, you do not become a citizen. Still, there are some countries where people arrived four centuries ago and they are considered as foreigners and outsiders. We have lessons to learn, because this, 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 this new way of looking at citizenship is very important. What is killing us in Africa is all these old ideas about where we come from. We all come from somewhere else. Nobody, you know, owns the place that we see. We have to introduce this new ideology in Africa, so Africans can integrate and freely mingle and, and live with each other. Ambassador I am. I am sorry, but uh, well, no, let me why, stop here. Why would you apologize? <laughs> let me stop here, maybe, and then deeply any, insightful. Any, any questions? Uh, I may. I, I will respond to later. Thank you. I, I hear a a kind of narrative unfolding between both of your initial comments regarding interdependence, uh, and while there is sovereignty and two independent states. 
the links, or as Professor Jock said, there remain unclear lines of separation, particularly on the cultural aspect, but even deeper, as you were pointing to. Professor Jock, one of the monumental tasks that has been laid upon your shoulders with other colleagues uh, has been to envision um, the symbolic shape of a nation, uh, including the preservation of certain cultural aspects uh, and, and the articulation in public forms of how memory is formed on a national stage. Uh, you're tasked with building a, a national, the first national museum. And I, just to quote you from an article, you state that from the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, you stated that there are those who think of war memorials as useful tools for documenting the experiences of war, helping communities come to terms with history and for repairing damaged relationships in the hope that peace coexistence and tolerance will prevail after years of protracted conflict. Others believe that war memorials are constant reminders of the horrors of the past, inflaming old wounds and perpetuating hatred between communities with a history of ethnic, religious, or racial divisions. That's a dilemma I imagine you face in yeah. thinking through what a national museum might look like. Yes, indeed, uh, I think uh, that is a dilemma uh, that we face not just in terms of commemorating the past so that the future generations don't forget on whose shoulders they stand, but it's also a, a, a dilemma in, 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 in which, which aspects of that history do you choose to commemorate and which one to exclude if you are confronted with a situation where there is such diversity to make it impossible to record everything. So which ones do you choose, which one do you exclude? Uh, it's, a, it's a serious challenge because there are two things. One, the very idea of the liberation war in South Sudan and the separation were based on a, a a, a complaint of exclusion, cultural exclusion, that people of South Sudan have not been represented culturally on a national stage, in the media, in, um, in, 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 the, in the commemoration of their histories, in ex their inclusion in textbooks, and so forth. So then if you have a new country, um, you would be faced with, by, with another challenge, which is uh, an, an inherent human double standard, ethnic double standard, where you wage a struggle to achieve something against uh, a, a tragic situation, um, such as the South Sudanese have faced. But then the minute you are on your feet again, you turn around and do unto others the very same thing that was done unto you, which you complained about. Mm -hmm. So to avoid the double standard that has been observed throughout humanity, uh, we think that South Sudan has come into existence at an opportune moment in human history where you can pick what has worked and avoid what has failed in other countries. We have the benefit of the of the, uh, of the foresight of other countries that have come before us. So the trick, of course, is selecting carefully what to remember so that everybody sees themselves represented on a national stage. To do so, um, in South Sudan, we think you have to project a symbolic situation where everybody will have participated in talking about what needs to be commemorated. So what we do, for example, um, and this is ongoing, is to, to, to go around the country to ask people how they would wish their war experience to be presented in a memorial. So the school children, the farmers, 
the artists of the community, the traditional chiefs, women, farmer, I mean, uh, uh, cattle herders, they will all be asked if, we, if there is a way in which you want your experience to be depicted in an abstract form in such a way that allows you to offload the history of the war and the burdens of that experience, what would it look like? So that what you have to, what you, what you produce in the end, whether it is a static memorial or a park or a performing art center where people can come and mourn and sing and, 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 and tell stories, it would have to come from the cumulative opinions that you have collected from all corners of the country. As you can see, it's a gigantic uh, uh, undertaking that cannot be done over time, nor can results be expected to accrue immediately. I think this is something that takes a generation before the results uh, uh, can be seen. What I'm aiming at in that regard is we have a country now. We have a political entity called South Sudan. We have the political entity called Sudan, the Republic of Sudan. Um, but what is more important than the geographical entity are the people who live on it. So you have states, but you don't have nations. So we want to be able to transform, uh, I think it was a, an Italian statesman who said that now that when Italy who was finally uh, unified at the, at the end of the um, uh, 18th century, um, who said that, I mean 19th century, uh, who said that now that we have Italy, uh, it is time that we make the Italians. So, so, so those are uh, strong words, uh, emblematic of the kinds of diversity that exist in some of the countries that we are trying to turn into nations. Uh, nation building is not the same thing as state building. And the, the, the work of the cultural, uh, people, the students of culture like myself and Brother Sati uh, is to try to use the culture the arts, the people's experiences as foundations of a nation so that people express their citizenship in the nation and not in the tribes, not in the ethnic groups, not in the races, not in the religions. And so for a country like South Sudan, it would be ideal to have everybody look at South Sudan as their tribe and not the Dinka or the Nuer or the Shuluk or what have you. That's the idea. Professor Jock, in your earlier comments, you referenced the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and described individuals in that ceremony without the reference to Colin Powell as, as, as the Arab in the room. Um, we know that General Lazarus Sumbeo, chief mediator of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, is still working with us on the Sudan-South Sudan Dialogue Group initiative and co-chairing that along with our friend Ambassador David Kopia of Tanzania, one of the unanticipated fruits of that dialogue group initiative uh, has been a more deliberate conversation between the two of you around socio-cultural cooperation or shared memories. Um, Ambassador Sati, perhaps, and, I, and, and you bring like Professor Jock, much to this discussion from your previous backgrounds with UNESCO and, 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 and representing UNESCO in Ethiopia and so forth. But can you speak to the, the, the shared cultural heritage and the vision that, that you may have in terms of advancing some of that work? And, and if I may just preface it, much of our discussions that we've held together through earlier series have dwelt on the negative, because that's what we hear in the media. That's what we see in news reports, the oil shutdown, continued fighting. And rarely uh, do we hear this kind of conversation uh, that recognizes commonality. Mm. Could you speak to this? Yeah, um, sure. Um, the Sudan, South Sudan uh, dialogue group uh, actually uh, has been working for some time on, on these issues that we, we have been talking about, you know, uh, issues of uh, uh, citizenship, issues of uh, uh, exchange, uh, border exchanges, uh, and, 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 and building confidence and trust between the two, the two peoples or the two uh, countries. 
Uh, and uh, the cultural issue uh, uh, occupies, I think, uh, a central place in this uh, debate. Uh, as uh, my brother Jock has just said, uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, when uh, people meet together and interact together and, 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 and form a community together, at the end of the day, it is the culture that cements the relations between them. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I think that uh, when you look at the, the history of, of our area or our region, uh, you would find a strand that has been uniting uh, our peoples uh, in that region uh, for many centuries. Uh, we have been uh, together talking uh, about what are the possibilities of looking at these commonalities that un unify us. Uh, what are these uh, 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 artifacts? What are these moments in history that we can invoke that would help us uh, to find uh, uh, an outlet, to find uh, a way out uh, for our dilemma that we are living together? Uh, so we, we have uh, uh, been uh, talking uh, to our colleagues uh, in the Carter Center uh, and the museum that we, uh, the Carlos Museum that we have visited this morning, uh, and when we went into the Nubian section of it, uh, we have been uh, talking about this, these issues. That uh, Nubian artifacts now are discovered not only in North Sudan, but they are being discovered to the south of Khartoum, as, as far as Malakal in, in the south. Uh, and the research is not terminated yet. Uh, we believe that there is a, a culture, a common culture that has existed for, for many centuries. And this uh, culture can be the basis uh, of this commonality that we are taking, uh, talking about. Uh, the two peoples have interacted for so long, uh, and they have formed together what I can call uh, a Sudanese identity, uh, which is also an identity which is joins, joins other identities in, in the region. Uh, to form uh, a common basis also uh, for this uh, uh, unity that we are seeking. If it is not today uh, a unity of countries, it's at least a unity uh, of the peoples, a unity of the cultures, a unity of heritage. And we are trying together now uh, to look at uh, what are these elements in our common history, common heritage, uh, and common culture, uh, and common socialization that can we uh, bring out uh, to the world so that the world will have another image and another idea about our region and our people and about our countries rather than this negative idea that has been uh, going on for too long. Uh, it is important, of course, while doing that, we move from this culture of war to a culture of peace that we have been working on with the UNESCO for so long in this region and other regions. We look at our welfare rather than our warfare. We look at our communities and working together and living together rather than violent confrontation and violent conflict that we have been in. It is a change of mindset that is necessary so as to focus more on things that unite us that, uh, rather than things that, that separate us. For too long, we have been uh, focusing uh, on our differences. And there are differences. There are differences in any society, in any community, in any family. There are differences. But we should not demur all the time and, and, and focus uh, on these differences. There are other things that, that unite us uh, and, and other positive aspects of our life uh, and our livelihoods that we should look at. Uh, people are, uh, when I look at our brothers and sisters from the South, I have lived in Nairobi for many years when the war is still going. And when now uh, with my brothers and sisters from, from the, the, the SPLM, including the family of the late George Garan, uh, Madame Rebecca and her children, let me tell you a story. When we arrived in Nairobi in June 1998, Madame Rebecca Garang heard that there is Mr. Satyan family who arrived there. She came to my house, met with my wife, with her children, who were still at a young age at that time, 98. And she said, uh, Madame Sati, I have been told many things about you, that you have been you know, around the world, and that you have daughters and all. 
I want my children to come and play with your children. I want them to learn Arabic and to learn the Sudanese culture. That's Madame Rebecca Gang. And since that day, they have been coming every weekend, and my children have been going to them. And, and this is really the Sudanese culture, the Sudanese spirit that I've been talking about. Hmm. How do we preserve this? How do we recreate it among ourselves? I think it's our duty uh, to do that. Let us widen the conversation and invite some of our, 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 our friends and, and neighbors to ask some questions from the audience. There are, are also those in the virtual world who have posed some questions to you. And while people may be moving to mics to ask questions, one of those posed to us from uh, the, the web relates specifically to the Sudan-South Sudan Dialogue Group Initiative. And it, it says, does the dialogue initiative have any bearing on the formal peace process between the two countries, recognizing that the Sudan-South Sudan Dialogue Group initiative is an informal platform, strengthening trust between neighbors, but not a formal process as such? Does it have any bearing on the formal process? Please. Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we also ask the same question among ourselves about whether we have any, any influence on the processes, on the formal processes that are ongoing. And, uh, and while we recognize the, the sensitivities involved in us being perceived perhaps as a parallel process, uh, we do think that our individual roles in our, in our communities, in, in our governments, uh, can uh, allow for our ideas that we are discussing to trickle into the formal process so that when our negotiators meet, they will keep in mind some of the things that have come from the informal process. And I think that is the only way to go about it uh, because we don't want to, to have competing processes. Uh, all we want to do is to be able to talk among ourselves, come to specific conclusions, and then find ways to transmit those conclusions into the formal processes. I think that is, um, that is uh, so indeed, we hope that it will have a bearing uh, on, the, on the formal negotiations uh, through these informal means that we use. The Ebony Center and the F uh, Future Studies Center in Khartoum, um, and also individual roles and our individual connections. Uh, Professor Sati, I mean Ambassador Sati, having uh, worked with so many people who are in the current government in Sudan, can use his connections, personal connections, to transmit some of the ideas that have emerged from our conversation. I mean, the, the, the point is, Sudan and South Sudan are living next to each other, and you don't have the opportunity to choose your neighbor. Yeah. So it is a, it's a matter of choosing uh, which way to, 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 to follow. The way of div div divisiveness and, and continued uh, acrimony uh, that has built on the many years of war, uh, or a way where you say, okay, we've had enough of war, let us try these other means. Since we are now two countries, the best thing to do for our, for our people and, uh, is to, to find ways to, to coexist. Because South Sudan and Sudan have the second longest border between any two countries on the African continent. 2,000 kilometers long even if the governments in Juba and Khartoum want to enforce a hard border, they cannot, because people are going to have to move. People move because they want to take their cows to go graze on the other side. People move because they have goods that they want to sell. People move because they, there, is, there is still a war ongoing between, on the border areas. People go whichever side they will feel secure in. So this mobility of population is what, going, is, is, what is going to, to, to form what will become two peaceful nations in the future. And we must bring those ideas to the negotiating table through these informal processes. Would you like to add to that, Ambassador Sati? Yeah, of course, um, I, I agree with what uh, my brother Jok has, has said. I, I fully uh, subscribe to what he says. Uh, of course, um, this is a very important, uh, I think, process that uh, the Carter Center uh, has started. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it fills uh, uh, gaps that may uh, uh, exist in the formal process. Um, from experience in the Great Lakes and the Horn of Africa and elsewhere, um, 
for you cannot implement any agreement without having uh, the backing of the people. Because at the end of the day, it's the people who, who implement the agreements, not the governments. The governments can negotiate them, they can conclude them, they can create the conditions for their implementation. But if there is no buy-in of the people, they will never be implemented. Um, we have cases in history where agreements have been signed and they have collapsed because they were not properly explained to the people or whether they were badly explained to the people, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, uh, so the, the situation now we are having is that um, the, the, the initiative that we are dealing with now needs to be better explained to the people. And we need to, as uh, Brother Joko was saying, uh, to get the buy-in uh, of those concerned authorities in two countries, because we cannot do it without them. And uh, we have to explain very clearly that this is an informal process. Uh, it does not uh, uh, interfere uh, in the formal process. It does not intend to replace any formal process. It does not intend to, 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 to interfere or to replace any roles that anybody uh, would be um, uh, playing uh, in, in the relation between the two countries. It's a friendly, informal, and people-to-people -people kind of process. And I think this can be the beginning uh, for a long, long, long process which will take us to uh, the people talking to each other, uh, the civil uh, society in both countries looking to, uh, talking to each other, acad academics talking to each other, think tanks in, in interacting with each other and creating the conditions uh, for uh, the uh, interaction between, uh, between the two people. So I, I, I think that uh, this is a viable process uh, we need to take it uh, forward together. We need to ex better explain it to the people, and we need to, to continue uh, working, working on it. Please, questions from the audience. There are mics on the right and on the left. You're most welcome to move forward if you have questions. Uh, Ambassador Sati, you noted earlier that a lot of these uh, perceived differences are very much constructed by the few who sort of benefit from them. So I was wondering if uh, both of you maybe could touch on the current political situation on the ground. Um, and I'm thinking in specifically about the current uh, protest in Sudan um, and the pressure against Bashir and how the current political situation impacts the construction of identity. And perhaps do you see that the situation is ripe to uh, push forward a dialogue of unity and commonality or are the few that have an incentive in maintaining sort of distinctness still there. Why don't we take one more question? Good evening, everyone. My name is Noor Kurmayol. I'm a former Lord Boy of Sudan, particularly South Sudan. I came in 2001 to the United States. I have five questions, although the time will limit me, but I will I will welcome uh, as <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would encourage you to be economic in your choice of questions. <laughs> Thank you one again. Brothers, uh, for the job and Ambassador Sati, welcome to the United States. My question to you is the war between the two countries will not be the solution. I need your, your freedom, Omer al-Bashir, to understand that there is no country with no citizen. If, if, if both countries keep fighting over the resources, and if they finish the resources, who going to be benefit with that resource? So the war must need to be stopped. That, that first question. Su Sudan never rests in peace, and Sudan never fight with any country after independence from British. Sudan has been fighting his own citizen for 50 something years. That need to stop. We are here, the Sudanese and the North Sudanese in the Western country, we will speak up for the peace for our people to live in peace. Enough is enough. 2.5 million people died, 
And I thought Ibn Qadir Center will be brave enough to bring President Bashir and sit on that table. This is the question. The referendum of ABA, what is it now? We never heard anything about the referendum of ABA. Mm -hmm. And for you to understand, I'm from Ruwen County. I'm from Farieng. I'm a son who owned the border with the North. I know how things are hard in my land. I know. I just came back from South Sudan in June. So there's nothing we don't understand there. We need you to tell the truth to the world. When you come here, you lie you in heaven. You need to tell the truth. When you go home, share it with your citizen. Because you come here, you learn something. Go and talk with the citizen. And the government will not solve the problem without talking with the citizen. Sioux country will not bring peace in the military. They will bring peace when sit together with their own side citizen. The northern citizen and the southern citizen, they need to sit together. We have the same DNA. Like you, you sitting with my brother there, you both have the same DNA. Why we kill ourselves? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we take two more yeah. questions, and there's one gentleman in front of you, I apologize. Um, the first question, Ambassador Sati, was to you in terms of the ripeness for constructive dialogue in Sudan, given uh, the nature of internal political dynamics? Well, um, I think that the, the situation is, is ripe for, for dialogue. Uh, and uh, dialogue is, is important, uh, especially in, in uh, moments of crisis, because there is no other way than dialogue. Uh, if the situation is, uh, is difficult, if you have a crisis, if you have violent conflict, the only way to end that is, is, is dialogue. So I think the, the situation is right. It may be complex, it may be complicated, it may be difficult. Uh, dialogue may, may, may uh, encounter some, some hurdles or obstacles, but I think it's necessary. It needs to be done, and, and the sooner the better, actually. Um, several extremely important points were raised uh, by our, our friend from South Sudan, uh, one of which was related to bringing President Bashir to here and on this stage to have conversation and asking in a sense, why don't we do this? Uh, I think Ambassador Sati has pointed to a, a critical uh, element or um, belief uh, that we undertake here at the Carter Center that, in fact, dialogue with all parties is essential to peacemaking. Even those we might perceive or who may, in fact, be our enemies are precisely the individuals with whom we need to be in direct communication. There would, and I would defer to Dr. Hardman <laughs> on this, there would be a slight complication, legally speaking, for us to make that invitation to President Bashir on this stage, precisely because of the role of the International Criminal Court, uh, the indictment for alleged crimes against humanity uh, in Darfur. Having said that, that doesn't prevent us as an institution from having that direct communication with President Bashir, which we continue to do in the spirit of peacemaking. Professor Jok, the question was raised about Abiyé and the final status of Abiyé. Uh, the referendum on the right to self-determination of the people of the South did not include Abiyé. And as far as I understand it, as, as Ambassador Sati referenced, the cooperation agreements included um, reference to a process whereby the people of Abiyé could vote for their own self-determination. Um, what is the status and what are the prospects for the resolution of, of the situation there? That's a very difficult one. Um, the, the status of the referendum is that obviously the, the Al-Bashir's government has rejected the AU proposal 
to have the referendum done in October, um, today, on the 15th. Um, but the government in, in the government in South Sudan and the people of Abia say that they should do it unilaterally because we have waited long enough. Um, I think uh, there are there for me there are two ways to respond to that question. Uh, one as a as a South Sudanese national, hopefully a nationalist at that. Um, I would say the people of Abia have suffered a great deal and they need to be, to be given the opportunity to decide for themselves. Um, but as, as, as an individual who tends to, to try by all means to be objective, I would say a unilateral referendum in Abia would not be a solution. In fact, it might be a, a disaster because uh, if Sudan does not agree, uh, it might a, a unilateral referendum might be the opportunity that some elements in the Khartoum government were waiting for to to spoil everything else, uh, to invade Abia to provoke South Sudan in, back into war. Because obviously if Abia was occupied again by Sudan armed forces, I don't think the SPLA will stand watching. It would be the perfect moment for anybody who hated the idea of South Sudan in, independence to provoke a situation where a, a, an all out war between the two countries uh, could break out, and that would be not in the interest of anyone. Surely not in the interest of South Sudan. Not because South Sudan can, would be defeated, but simply because South Sudan has refused, the leaders of South Sudan have refused openly to be provoked back into a war with Sudan. Because we have seen, when you see war from afar, you might think of it as a mundane way of an, or another way of doing politics. But when you have lived in war, uh, it is not something you wish in, on any other human. And it is only those who never go to war who are quick to order it. And so uh, I think it is not the right a step to try to make a unilateral uh, a referendum in, in, in RBA. What I would think, uh, what, I, what I think would be more sensible is to, to continue to work diplomatically to urge the AU to take on the process. If the AU, as they had proposed, the AU High Implementation Panel led by Thabo Mbeke, if they were the ones taking the resolution to the UN, to the Security Council, so that there is a more collective international effort to bring pressure to bear on the government of Khartoum to decide one way or the other, then I think that would be a more a viable process. Ambassador Sati, <clears throat> RBA is very much at the center of that inter or exchange of cultures that you have both been describing this evening. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are uh, options uh, that allow for a more viable and sustainable peace in RBA uh, instead of leading to what uh, Professor Jock described? Um, when we talk about the referendum in RBA, let us remember another referendum that took place. The referendum that was based on the CPA, and as a result of which Southern Sudan has obtained its independence. I would like to say that the Sudanese of the present Sudan have accepted uh, to implement the CPA. They have accepted the referendum. The referendum has given uh, South Sudan its independence. Abiyye is one of the issues uh, that have resulted of that independence. 
And I think we should be more, um, I wouldn't say compromising, but I think we, we should try and understand the complexity of the situation. Uh, had that referendum been possible in the current circumstances, it would have taken place. Because the, the bigger one, the first one, has taken place, and the two sides agreed to it. And this should be our yardstick. Whatever we agree upon mutually, we should implement. If there is a difference, then we have to continue talking to each other. This is my first point. Uh, this does not mean that I would like to deny the Dinkan Gok their right uh, to, to abjay. Uh, this should be decided uh, by this referendum, of course. I do not want to have my own referendum and decide what's going to happen. My second point is uh, in answer to your question. I have always thought of Abye as an opportunity rather than a problem. An opportunity because it is an area, it's a place where North Sudanese and South Sudanese have been interacting for centuries. Not years, centuries. Not less than 300 years, they have been living together. There have, they have been uh, movements from one side to the other, uh, and they have been living in relative peace. There have been problems in the past. Many of them, even when I was a young boy, I remember that there have been problems, but the, the legendary uh, two chiefs from both sides sat together and resolved those problems. The problem has been complicated now because both Juba and Khartoum, for their own purposes, have decided to take the decisions on behalf of the people of Abyei, on both sides. And I always believed that if we had allowed the Dinkan Gok on one side and the Miseria to sit together and to resolve this conflict, it would have been resolved a long time ago. I still think that this was the way we should go. Because they know better than anybody else what exactly uh, uh, is happening uh, uh, that. Uh, so I, I, in conclusion, I would think of it is as an area of integration. If we are talking about soft borders, that's the place where we should start. Because it's an obvious uh, place where people can intermingle, can move freely, and can work together in order to, to manage that place. The idea of sovereignty is important. It should be decided upon, but I think they should do it when they are ready uh, to do that. <clears throat> Professor Yamadu Diop, Ambassador Nuruddin, my greeting to you. My name is Medin Dor, American citizen, South Sudan original. <laughs> My first question to you, Mr. Ambassador Nureddin. We're talking about peace in two Sudan. But Sudan is still have bombermen to bombing in South Sudan, especially Northern Barakazal and Unity State. But it's been denied, say that and looking for rebel in South Sudan. So the rebel is in South Sudan. But when I go back to sit down and, re and, and remind and mobilizing what I have in my mind, the time when we are in the bush, we were in Ethiopia and Uganda and Kenya. And no one day Sudan went there and bombed the city of this country I've been mentioned. It's because this country, they have a power, or the, 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 the air force, and South Sudan, they have air force. That's why every time go bomb and kill citizens, citizens of South Sudan, innocent people. The question to you. We talk about the border, or we talk about peace. How the two countries been saved with our border? And we've been talking about peace. Sudan is don't want to be South Sudan to be be defend country.
to have his own burden. It's because the burden we don't have, that's why students go every time and bump. Prison self uh, uh, professor and the secretary. Our prison self is being called Bashir every time when he speaks. Brother Bashir. And I saw Bashir, no one day called self brother. And, and also one day, Bashir called South Sudanese insect. So, what is concerning then when the Bashir called South Sudanese insect is because they want to bomb them, to kill them for weapon or chemical weapon. That's why they call us insect. Mr. Professor Jong Mudu Jong I'm South Sudanese, I'm in America, but I was born for a referendum and South Sudan became the country. When the South Sudan became a country, my home country, my homeland was dishonored me. When I go back at home and say, you're not South Sudanese, you're American. So how do I been feeling to go back home? Because I have hope to go back home anytime, but it's dishonored been to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because as a teenager in America, I just want to help as much as I can. And I was wondering, if I could help at all, what could I do? Thank you. Thank you, indeed. A very difficult first question, and, and indeed second question. Yeah. Um, the first question, referencing the uh, reports of ongoing bombings along the border, to what extent that is continuous, um, and, and also referencing the, the problem of public discourse in both states, and how that impacts perception and reality. Uh, and, and finally, uh, a question of identity and belonging. Uh, as a South Sudanese who has been in the diaspora, um, returning to the new nation that is South Sudan and finding perhaps that he is not welcome. Um, so a question of, of, of belonging and identity. Ambassador Sati, why don't you begin in terms of the, the, the bombings and the public discourse? Well, the bombings, of course, uh, we have said we are men and women of peace, and we are against war. And we would like to do everything we can in, do in, in order to stop the war, in order to stop those bombings. If they are still going on, we do not know. We should do everything to stop the war, the war between the two countries. What, what, what is the cause behind this? As, as a man who has been working for culture of peace for many years and working on, on peacekeeping for the United Nations, my role has always been to go to the root causes of problems and try to stop uh, what is happening. We, of course, bombings are not to be accepted. They are to be condemned. There is no doubt about that. But if you want to be helpful, we want to go to the sources of the problems that are causing all these bombings and stop these, uh, these, these issues, these problems from happening. And that's exactly what we have been talking about since we came here this evening. That there are reasons why conflicts, uh, violent conflicts is happening. We recognize these problems, but we would like to help in resolving these problems. And the fact that there is ongoing war, whether it's bombing, whether it's other things, whether it's in between the two countries or whether within both countries, we would like to help stop this war. And we think that we have proposed to you how we can do to stop them. The second question is? On, on the public discourse, and you hear things like brother, and then you hear things that may dehumanize? Well, of course, this is not acceptable. I mean, uh, politicians have to watch what they are saying. 
especially when uh, it, it concerns the dignity of, of, our pe of other people, wherever it comes from. Uh, we need to be courteous to each other, and this is part of the culture of peace we have been talking about. We need to be courteous to each other. We need to be uh, respectful to each other. Uh, we need, for me, and that's what we have been saying, we have been focusing on differences for too long. It's high time that we focus on the positive aspects of, of brotherhood and sisterhood, as calling each other brother, calling each other sister, but it has to come from the heart, and we have to mean it. And when I'm calling my dear brother, joke uh, brother, I really mean it, because he is a brother. And I will not say anything that would be dehumanizing. Yeah, I agree. I think um, the, the rhetoric, first of all, the, the, the question of insects that uh, Angor was talking about was a, a, I'm not justifying it, but it was a play on words. You know, the, the SPLM, the ruling party in South Sudan, uh, in Arabic, is called Haraka and, and uh, movement, means movement. So. The, the word haraka was changed by al-Bashir in a moment of rage to hashara, which means insect. And, uh, and it's, it's not acceptable for a head of a state to call a ruling party of another country insects. I mean, I would think even it reflects badly on him than on the people he's trying to dehumanize, for a head of a state to call other people insects. Um, and this is part of the problem that we are trying to say that what our politicians have done up to this moment has not served us, and it will destroy both countries even further going forward. And that perhaps if we have some discussions among ordinary citizens, because it sounds simplistic, but I think when people are talking, they are less likely to fight. So <laughs> it's, it's that kind of dialogue that we're trying to encourage and foster between the people who live in the areas where more trouble is caused by decisions made from so far away. Like the people who live in the, in the border states, 10 states on the border between the two countries is where the majority of our people live. It's also the economic heartland of both countries. So trying to get these people to talk to one another about how they can share the resources and how they can revive some historical relationships among themselves will stabilize that region so that Khartoum has no excuse to bomb on the other side under the pretext that they are looking for rebels because there will no longer be any rebels if there is a relationship between the two people. Um, and perhaps some of these uh, conflicts will be, will be reduced and people will be able to, to use the resources, uh, human and natural resources that uh, the, the region is endowed with to foster good relationships and therefore reducing the possibility of the, of the ruling parties and the political leaders having to use this kind of terrible language. And I, and, uh, with regards to South Sudan's ability to absorb its diaspora population, um, it, 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 it obviously it's a very difficult uh, thing for a citizen who, ran, who, who was a liberation fighter like himself, I know him, and then as a boy, he, was, he fought as a young person and he traveled on foot from Sudan to Ethiopia and back to Sudan and to Kenya and Uganda, ending up in the United States. It's a miraculous journey for any, 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 any human being to have to go through. And then to go home now when the country has become home and it is an independent state, to find that there are challenges in reintegrating, um, nothing can be more disheartening. Uh, but those are the realities of a country that is uh, looking for its sense of self. As it just became independent, it has to it has to, to look to search for that which will stabilize it from within. And one of the things that stabilizes a country like that is 
uh, some progress on the development front. You know, uh, the, the conflicts that are ongoing within South Sudan are largely resource conflicts. And so is the attempt to exclude the returning diaspora. It is also a struggle over government resources so that even if he comes with a skill that he can sell, he might not find a way to sell that skill because somebody else will elbow him, uh, elbow him out because there is still some struggle over the meager resources the country has in its, uh, in its possession. So I think it is, uh, it is uh, it's, 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 you call it growing pains uh, or teething pains, um, and, but it, it, it will work itself out because all countries are made by their citizens. Uh, no country is handed to you perfect. You get it. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with a manual, with a user's manual <laughs> to, to, to figure out uh, how, to, how to build it, to, be, to be, be comfortable, to be peaceful, to be stable and prosperous, uh, to be the country that people like him and myself have yearned for all our lives. To be that, it takes time. And I think that is what we are trying to do, uh, and to be slightly uh, more understanding and more patient with the process of building our country to be a place that we all had aspired for. Before we conclude, the rhetoric that was being referred to, I think in recent months, we have seen um, an improved state of bilateral relations through the public lens and at the highest level. Um, and to a certain extent, an improved uh, rhetoric and, and discourse uh, between the, the heads of state. As closing remarks, if, if you could both briefly reflect upon what in fact are, from your perspectives, the prospects in real terms for peace between and within the two Sudans. Ambassador Sati. Well, I remain convinced that the prospects are, are are positive for peace between the two countries because I feel that uh, after two years of huggling and uh, struggling and fighting uh, uh, and misunderstanding each other, uh, now the two countries have realized that there is no the only option for them uh, to survive economically, socially, and politically and live together in peace and harmony. Uh, is to resolve their differences. That they are interconnected uh, together. There is, they have an interest uh, in exploiting together the natural resources between them and the talents of their population. Uh, the leaders have finally realized that it's important for them in their own interest, the interest of their governments, the interest of the peoples, uh, to live together in harmony and seek ways and, 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 and means uh, of finding a solution to their problems. So I think we, we are finally on, on the right track, but it's not going to be easy. It's still going to be a pumpy ride uh, because there are still problems which are there that we need, we need a lot of wisdom, we need a lot of patience, we need a lot of imagination in order to resolve those problems. We need also to practice politics in a different way, whether it's in Sudan or South Sudan. We have a legacy of politics that has been destructive, that have been negative for over half a century now. The Sudanese and South Sudanese have to look into the way that have been doing things so far, especially the political elite in these, those countries. They have to be more understanding of the realities of their countries and the needs and interests of their populations. They have to educate their populations in a different way. They have to send positive messages to the population to live in harmony. What we see now is a political discourse which is encourages hate and violent confrontation and barren and sterile rhetoric between the two countries. It has produced populations who have a lot of acrimony against each other. 
they have become so passionate uh, in the way they look at their relations. They have become uh, negative in the way they look at their future. I think the time has come for us. Uh, we who are educators, who are responsible people, who are academicians, uh, to advise our respective governments and to see to it that our people learn, the, the governments and the people learn the lessons of the past. My dear brother and colleague, uh, Professor Jock, has just said that there is no manual for, for governance. But the book of history is open. If we do not know what to do, we know what to avoid. And the lessons are there. The mistakes that have been committed, they are there to see. And we know the pitfalls, we know all the problems, we know the traps that we need to avoid, whether it's in Sudan or in South Sudan or in the region at large. We have been talking about good governance for a long time. Good governance is not a, it should not be seen as a concept that is imported from the West. It is something that should be ingrained in our societies, in our governments and in our political uh, elite also. So the, I would like to end by saying, uh, uh, let us work for this new culture, new political culture. And my answer to the young lady who asked, uh, how can I help? I would tell her and her colleagues, the way you can help is to understand and learn exactly what is going on in Sudan and South Sudan and the region. Try as much as possible to get the truth of the matter and the facts of what is happening. There is a lot of disinformation that is going on about that situation. And I advise you to try as best as you can to know exactly the reality by reading and, uh, and learning about the reality of the situation and not to learn uh, to hasty judgments and taking sides. It is not a match of football or soccer. It is the life of the people. Taking sides and biases without reflecting and knowing what the situation is, is very dangerous. And that was the reason where we are now having this world where everybody seems to be at the throat of the other. Thank you. Professor Jock, a final word on prospects for Thank peace. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that um, uh, Ambassador <clears throat> Sati has remembered the question of the young lady. I, I have forgotten about it. And I agree with him completely that uh, educating yourself on the situation is the is, is starting point. And there are many ways to do it. Uh, there is, of course, the reading and, 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 and reflection on, on, on what you read, but also befriending people from the region. Uh, these, these, these other young men in the, in, the, in the audience who come from the place can be your teachers on the situation there. Uh, not uh, teachers on everything, but teachers on some aspects of their own experience um, so that you, you are able to reflect uh, on that situation based on some degree of uh, factual information. Um, on the prospects for peace uh, between the two countries, I think the starting point really, while it is important, the peace between the two countries, I think that both countries need to also look to look within, within themselves. Uh, the Republic of Sudan continues to be torn apart by a terrible, terrible conflict in Darfur, in Blue Nile, and in, uh, in South Kordofan. Um, the same for South Sudan. There are some uh, very, very violent episodes of conflict along ethnic lines or along political lines that South Sudan would have to try to sort out uh, on, its, on, on its own. And, and so long as there are conflicts within each country, each of them is going to find a way to be involved in the conflict in the other. Whether it is a way to deflect attention away from your own problems or a way to blame the other for your problems. And so uh, the, one of the ways to, 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 to help these two countries forge a, 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 a peaceful future is to help them settle their own internal conflicts. Um, there is already work to this effect being done by many, many people around the world, including the Carter Center, 
Um, and, and we really uh, hope that uh, the, the visit of, of President Carter to, to, to Sudan in a few months uh, will, will contribute towards the search for settlement of conflicts within the Republic of Sudan. Uh, because you cannot go and solve the problems of the other while you have your own problems. Uh, it does not help for you to be critical of the other on the basis of the conflicts they have when you are not able to solve your own problems internally. So the question for us in South Sudan is, what is it that uh, causes this uh, turmoil, these conflicts? One of them is the history of the conflict, which has left behind a massive amount of uh, small arms and light weapons. And for us in South Sudan, small arms and light weapons are the weapons of mass destruction, not the atomic bomb. And, and, and so to reflect on that history and try to forge reconciliation uh, among the different ethnic groups uh, is, is, is key. And the way to do it, at least one, of, one, one way to do it is to, for all the South Sudanese to agree on the correct narrative of how the war affects the people of South Sudan, on the correct description of what has happened to the people of South Sudan. And one way to do it is to, to do that is to, to have a discussion, conversation through reconciliation, and there is a process now beginning for peace and reconciliation to take place, uh, which will go around the country. Uh, and once you have really hone in on the pointed moments in the history of South Sudan for the last 50 years to sort out what are those conflicts and talk about them and memorialize them in some way uh, is, 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 the, is the best way to move ahead. Because until we have recognized the ills that we have done to one another, I don't think it is going to be easy to, 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 to move forward. And, and so on that dilemma that uh, Etonde read earlier, I would rather go for clear, honest discussion on what has happened, what we have done to one another, and have a war, civil, a civil war memorial, several memorials on the, on, on the borders between South Sudan and North Sudan, where uh, both the South Sudanese who uh, talk about be, having been victims can talk with people whom they think were perpetrators. In a performative memorial, it can be a park, it can be a performing arts center, it can be a place where people can meet and mourn together and, 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 and talk about what has happened to them. Um, that, I think the focus on the, on the political leadership, the focus on the, on the state level discussions is not going to bring that kind of peace. I think what, what, what will bring a lasting and sustainable peace is a peace reached by the people themselves because they are the ones who live in these situations where conflict is constantly taking place. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you to, to both of you, Professor Jock, Ambassador Sati, for taking the time in your very busy schedules to be with us in conversation here at the Carter Center. And thank you for those who are here this evening uh, to participate your interest not only in the work of the Carter Center, but the concerns of the global issues that, that face all of us. The next program in our conversation series at the Carter Center is Using Technology for Peace on Tuesday, December 10th uh, at 7. Uh, you can visit the Carter Center website for more information and for further discussion on the same subject. I would encourage you to take a look at the Institute for Developing Nations website where the series on prospects for peace has been documented. Again, thank you for joining us. And I would end on a quote that I think both of them stated, namely that dialogue is important, especially in times of crisis. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much.